know not why I am so sad. It wearies me, and you say it wearies you. How I caught it, found it, came by it. What stuff tis made of? Whereof it is born? I am to learn. And such a want wit sadness makes me. I have much ado to know myself. Your mind is tossing on the ocean. There were your argosies with portly sail, like seniors and rich burghers on flood, or as it were the pageants of the sea do overpeer the petty traffickers that curtsy to them, do them reverence as they fly by them with their woven wings. Believe me, sir, had I such venture forth, the better part of my affections would be with my hopes abroad. I should be still, plucking the grass to see where sits the wind, peering in maps for ports and piers and roads, and every object that might make me fear misfortune to my ventures, out of doubt would make me sad. My wind cooling my broth would blow me to an ague when I thought what harm a wind too great might do at sea. I should not see the sandy hourglass run, but I should think of shallows and of flats and see my wealthy Andrew docked in sand, <laughs> veiling her high top lower than her ribs to kiss her burial. Should I go to church and see the holy edifice of stone and not bethink me straight of dangerous rocks, which touching but my gentle vessel's side would scatter all her spices on the stream, and robe the roaring waters with my silks, and in a word, but even now worth this, and now worth nothing? Shall I have the thought to think on this, and shall I lack the thought that such a thing but chance would make me sad? But tell not me, I know Antonio is sad to think upon his merchandise. Believe me, no. I thank my fortunes for it. My, my ventures are not in one bottle trusted, nor to one place, nor is my whole estate upon the fortune of this present year. Therefore, my merchandise makes me not sad. Why, then you are in love. <laughs> fie, fie. Not in love, neither. Then let us say you are sad because you are not married. <laughs> And twas easy to laugh and leap and say you were merry because you are not sad. Now, by two-headed Janus, nature hath framed strange fellows in her time. Some that will evermore peep through their eyes and laugh like parrots at a bagpiper. And others of such vinegar aspect that there and there show their teeth in way of smile, though Nestor swear the jest be laughable. Here comes Bassanio, your most noble kinsman. Gratiano and Lorenzo, fare you well. We leave you now with better company. I would have stayed till I had made you merry, if worthier friends had not prevented me. Oh, your worth is very dear in my regard. I take it your own business calls on you, and you embrace the occasion to depart. Good morrow, my good lords. Uh, good ladies both. When shall we laugh? Say when. You grow exceedingly strange. Must it be so? We'll make our leisure to attend on yours. Well, my lord Bassanio, since you have found Antonio, we too will leave you. But at dinner time, I pray you, have in mind where we must meet. I will not fail you. Signor Antonio, you, uh, you have done well. <laughs> you have uh, too much respect upon the world. They lose it to divide with much care. Believe me, you are uh, marvelously changed. I hold the world where it is the world, Gratiano. A stage where every man must play a part, and mine, a sad one. Well, let me play the fool, then. With mirth and laughter, let old wrinkles come. I'd rather my liver heat with wine than my heart cool with mortifying groans. Why should a man whose blood is warm within sit like his grandsire cut an alabaster and sleep when he wakes, creep into the jaundice by being peevish? I, I tell thee what, Antonio. I love thee, and it is my love for thee that speaks. There are a sort of men whose visages do cream and mantle like a standing pond, and do a willful stillness entertain, to be dressed in an opinion of wisdom, gravity, profound conceit, as if to say, I am Sir Oracle, and when I open my lips, let no dog bark. Hmm. My dear Antonio, I do know of thee. 
were therefore only reputed wise for saying nothing. <laughs> Which, I'm sure, if they should speak, would almost damn those ears and call their brothers fools. <laughs> More on this another time. <laughs> but fish not with this melancholy fate, this, this fool's gut, and this opinion. Come, good the rest. Uh, fare ye well a while. We'll, I'll end my exhortation after dinner. Well, we will review then till dinner time. I must be one of these same dumb wise men, for Gratiano never lets me speak. <laughs> well, keep me company, but uh, two years more, so I won't let all the sound of thine own voice. <laughs> Is that anything now? <laughs> Gratiano speaks an infinite deal of nothing, more than any man in all days. His reasons are as two grains of wheat hid in two bushels of chaff. You shall seek all day where you find them. And when you have them, they are not worth the search. <laughs> well, tell me now, what lady is the same to whom you swore a secret pilgrimage that you today swore to tell me of? It's not unknown to you, Antonio, how much I have disabled my estate by something showing a more swelling forth than my faint means would grant continuous. To you, Antonio, I owe the most in money and in love. And from your love I have a warranty to unburden all my plots and purposes, how to get clear of all the debts I owe. I pray, good Bassanio, let me know it. And if it stand, as you yourself still do, within the eye of honor, be assured, my purse, my person, my most extremist means lie all unlocked to your cave. In my school days, when I had lost one shaft, I shot his fellow of the self-same plight the self-same way, with more advising watch to find the other fourth. And by venturing both, I uh, found both. I urge this child's proof because what follows is pure innocence. I, I owe you much. And like a willful youth, that which I owe is lost. But if you please to so shoot another arrow, that self-way which you did shoot the first, I do not doubt, as I will watch the aim, or to find both, or to bring your other half back again, and thankfully rest, uh, deader for the first. <laughs> you know me well, and herein spend but time to wind about my love with circumstance. And in making doubt, you do me now more wrong in making question of my uttermost than had you made waste of all I have. Do but say to me what I can do. But it would, in your knowledge, by me can be done, and I am pressed unto it. Therefore, speak. Um, in Belmont is a lady, rich and fat. And she is fair, and fairer than that word of wondrous virtues. Sometimes from her eyes I did receive fair, speechless messages. Her name is Portia. Nothing undervalued to Cato's stuff. Fruit is Portia. Nor is the wide world ignorant of her word. For the four winds blow in from every coast, renowned suitors. And her sunny locks hang on her temples like a golden fleece, which makes her seat of Belmont Colchester's strand. And many Jasons come in touch with her. Oh, my Antonio, had I but the means to hold a rival place with one of them, I have a mind for sages me such threat. I should question this be fortunate. Mm, thou knowest all my fortunes are at sea. Neither have I money nor commodity to raise a present sum. Therefore, go forth. Try what my credit can in Venice do. That should be wrapped even to the uttermost to furnish thee to Belmont, to fair Portia. Go, presently inquire, and so will I where money is. And I, no mistake, will have it of my trust or for my sake. By my troth, Nerissa, my little body is a weary of this great world. You would be sweet, madam, if your miseries were in the same abundance as your good fortunes are. And yet for aught I see, they are as sick that surfeit with too much as they that starve with nothing. It is no mean happiness, therefore, to be seated in the mean. Superfluity comes sooner by white hairs, but competency lives longer. 
good sentences and well pronounced. They would be better if well followed. If to do were as easy as to know what were good to do, chapels had been churches and poor men's cottages princes' palaces. It is a good divine that follows his own instructions. I can easier teach twenty what were good to be done than be one of the twenty to follow mine own teachings. The brain may devise laws for the blood, but a hot temper leaps over a cold decree. And yet, this reasoning is not in the fashion to choose me a husband. Oh, me, the word choose. I can neither choose whom I would nor refuse whom I dislike. And so is the will of a living daughter curbed by the will of a dead father. Is it not hard, Marissa, that I cannot choose one nor refuse none? Your father was ever virtuous, and holy men at their death have good inspirations. Therefore, the lottery that he hath devised in these three chests of gold, silver, and lead, whereof who chooses his meaning chooses you, will no doubt never be chosen by any rightly, but one who shall rightly love. But what warmth is there in your affection towards any of these princely suitors that are already come? I pray thee, overname them, and as thou namest them, I will describe them, and according to my description, level at my affection. First, there is the Neapolitan prince. Aye, that's a colt indeed, for he doth nothing but talk of his horse. I am much afeard his mother played false with a smith. <laughs> then there is the County Palatine. He doth nothing but frown. He hears merry tales and smiles not. I fear he will prove the weeping philosopher when he grows old, being so full of unmannerly sadness in his youth. I had rather be married to a death's head with a bone in his mouth than to either of these. God defend me from these two. How like you the French lord, Monsieur Le Bon? Well, God made him, therefore let him pass for a man. <laughs> but in truth, I know it is a sin to be a mocker, but he, why, he hath a horse better than the Neapolitans, a better bad habit of frowning than the Count Palatine. But he is every man in no man. If a throstle sing, he falls straight to capering. He will fence with his own shadow. If I should marry him, I should marry twenty husbands. What say you then to Falconbridge, the young baron of England? You know, I say nothing to him, for he understands not me, nor I him. He hath neither Latin, French, nor Italian. He is a proper man's picture. <laughs> But alas, who can converse with a dumb show? <laughs> How like you the young chairman, the Duke of Saxony's nephew? Very vilely in the morning when he is sober, and most vilely in the afternoon when he is drunk. And when he is best, he is a little worse than a man, and when he is worst, he is a little better than a beast. If he should offer to choose, and choose the right casket, you should refuse to perform your father's will if you should refuse to accept him. Therefore, for fear of the worst, I pray thee, set a deep glass of Rhenish wine on the contrary casket. For if the devil be within, and that temptation without, I know he will choose it. Well, I'll do anything, Nerissa, and I'll be married to a sponge. You need not fear, lady, of having any of these lords. They have acquainted me with their determinations, which is indeed to return to their homes, and to trouble you with no more suit, unless you may be won by some other sort than your father's imposition, depending on the casket. If I live to be as old as Sibylla, I'll die as chaste as Diana, unless I be obtained by the manner of my father's will. I am glad this parcel of wooers is so reasonable, for there is not one among them, but I do dote on his very absence and I pray God grant them a fair departure. Do you not remember, lady, in your father's time, a Venetian, a scholar and a soldier who came hither in the company of the Marquis of Montferrat? Yes, yes, it was Bassanio, as I think so was he called. 
from the Prince of Morocco. He'll be here tonight. If I could bid the fifth welcome with so good a heart as I can bid the other four farewell, I should be glad of his approach. If he have the condition of a saint and the complexion of a devil, I had rather he would shrive me than wive me. Come, Nerissa, Sirah, go before. Whilst we shut the gates upon one wooer, another knocks at the door. Uh. Three thousand dollars. <laughs> well, I sir, for three months. For three months. Well, for the which, as I told you, Antonio shall be bound. Antonio shall become bound. May you stead me? Will you pleasure me? Shall I know your answer? Three thousand ducats for three months and Antonio Bow. Your answer to that? Antonio is a, a good man. Have you heard any imputation to the contrary? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, my meaning in saying he is a good man is to have you understand me that he is sufficient. Uh, yet his means are in supposition. He hath an argosy bound for tripness, uh, another to the Indies. I understand, moreover, upon the Rialto, he hath a third to Mexico, a fourth for England, and uh, other ventures he hath <laughs> squandered abroad. But ships are but boards, sailors but men. There be land rats and water rats, water thieves and land thieves. I mean pirates. Then there is the peril of water winds and rocks. The man is notwithstanding sufficient. Three thousand ducats. I think I may take his bond. I'll be assured you may. I will be assured I may. And that I may be assured, I will bethink me. May I speak to Antonio? Uh, if it please you to dine with us. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, to smell pork. To eat of the habitation which your prophet, the Nazarite, conjured the devil into. Uh, I will buy with you, sell with you, talk with you, walk with you, and so following. But I will not eat with you, drink with you, no pray with you. What news on the Rialto? Who is he comes here? This is Signor Antonio. How like a falling publican he looks. I hate him for he is Christian. But more for that in low simplicity. He lends out money gratis and brings down the rate of usance here with us in Venice. If I can catch him once, upon the hip. I would feed fat the ancient grudge I bear him. He hates our sacred nation, and he rails even there where merchants do congregate most on me, my bargains, and my well-won thrift, which he calls interest. Mm. Cursed be my tribe if I forgive him. Shalom. You're here. Ah, I am debating of my present store, and by the near guess of my memory, uh, I cannot instantly raise up the full gross of 3,000 ducats. What of that? Tubal, a wealthy Hebrew of my tribe, will furnish me. But soft, how many months do you desire? God rest you fair, good senor. Your worship was the last man in our mouths. <laughs> Although I neither lend nor borrow by taking nor by giving excess, 
Yet, to supply the right wants of my friend, I will break a custom. Is he yet possessed of how much you would? I, I have $3,000. And for three months? <laughs> I have forgot. Three months, you told me so. Uh, and let's see, your bond. And let me see, but hear you. Methought you neither lend nor borrow upon the damage. I do never use it. When uh, Jacob grazed his uncle Laban sheep, this Jacob from our holy Abram was, as his wise mother wrought in his behalf, the third possessor. Aye, he was the third. And what of him? Did he take interest? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not take interest. Not as you would say, directly into his father. When Laban and himself were compromised that uh, all the inlings which were streaked or pied should fall to Jacob's hire, the ewes being rank at the end of autumn turned to the rams. And when the work of generation was between these woolly breeders in the act, uh, a skillful shepherd peeled me certain bars, and in the deed of doing kind, he stocked them up before the fulsome ewes. Who then, conceiving did in evening time, fall party colored lambs? And these were Jacob's. This was a way to thrive, and he was blessed. And thrift is blessing if men steal it not. This was a venture, sir, that Jacob served for. One not in his hand to bring to pass, but swayed and fashioned by the hand of heaven. Was this inserted to make interest good, or is your gold and silver using ramps? <laughs> uh, I cannot tell. I make it breed as fast. But note me, senor. Mark you this, Bassanio. The devil can cite scripture for his purpose. An evil soul producing holy witness is like a villain with a smiling cheek. A goodly apple rotten at the heart. Oh, what a goodly outside falsehood. Ah. <laughs> ah. Three thousand dockets. It is a good round sum. Three months from twelve. Uh, then let me see the rate. But Shylock, will we be holding to you? Signor Antonio. Many a time and oft in the Rialto, you have rated me about my monies and my usances. Still have I borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever, cutthroat dog, and spit upon my Jewish gabardine. And all for the use of that which is my own. <laughs> now it appears you need my help. Go to then. You come to me and you say, Shylock, we would have monies. You say so. You who did not. <laughs> well, it is room upon my beard. And foot me as you spurn a stranger cur over your threshold. Money's is your suit. What should I say to you? Hmm? Should I not say that the dog money? Is it possible for a cur to lend 3,000 ducats? Or should I bend low and in the bondman's key with bated breath and whispered humbleness say this? Fair sir. You spit on me on Wednesday last. Uh, another day, uh, you spurned me. Another time, you called me dog. And for these courtesies, I'll lend you thus much money. I am as like to call thee so again, to spit on me again, to spurn me too. If thou would lend this money, let it not as to thy friends. For when did friendship take a breed for barren metal of his friend? Oh, but lend it as to thine enemy. 
who if it break, you may as with better face exact the penalty. Why, look you, how you saw. I will be friends with you and have your love. Forget the shades you have stained me with. Uh, supply your present wants and take no doubt of uses for my monies, and you'll not hear me. This is kind, I offer. Uh, this work kindness. <laughs> this kindness will I show. Go with me to the notary, seal me there your single bond, and in a merry sport, if you repay me not, on such a day, in such a place, such sum or sums as expressed in the condition, let the forfeit be nominated for an equal pound of your fair flesh to be cut off and taken in what part of your body pleases me. <laughs> Content in faith, I will seal to such bond. Then say there is much kindness in the Jew. You shall not seal to such a bond for me. I'll rather dwell in my necessity. Why, fear not, man. Within these two months, that's a month before this bond expires, I do expect thrice three times return of the value of this bond. What these Christians are, whose own hard battles uh, teaches them to suspect the thoughts of others. I pray you tell me, if he should break his day, what should I gain by the exaction of the forfeiture. A pound of man's flesh is not so estimable, profitable neither, as the flesh of muttons, beefs, and goats. I say, to buy his favor, I extend his friendship. If he will take it, so. If not, adieu. And for my love, I pray you, wrong me not. Yes, Shylock. I will seal up to this bond. And meet me at the notary, give them direction for our merry bond, and I will go and purse the ducat straight, see to my house, left in the fearful guard of an unthrifty day, and presently I will be with you. Hide hmm? me, gentle Jew. I like not fair terms in a villain's mind. Oh, come on. In this there could be no dismay. My ship's home a month before the day. Mislike me not for my complexion, the shadowed livery of the burnished sun, to whom I am a neighbor and near bred. Bring me the fairest creature northward born. Phoebus' fire scarce stalls the icicles, and let us make incision for your love to prove whose blood is reddest, his or mine. I tell thee, lady, this aspect of mine hath feared the valiant, and by my love I swear the best regarded virgins of our clime have loved it too. I would not change this hue, except to steal your thoughts, my gentle queen. In terms of choice, I am not solely led by a nice direction of a maiden's eyes. Besides, the lottery of my destiny bars me the rights of voluntary choosing. But if my father had not scanted me and hedged me by his wits to yield myself his wife, who wins me by that means, I told you, yourself, renowned prince, then stood as fair as any comer I have looked on yet for my affections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even for that, I thank you. Therefore, I pray, lead me to the caskets to try my fortune. By this scimitar that slew the Sophie and a Persian prince that won three fields of Sultan Soliman, I would outstare the sternest eyes that look, outbrave the heart most buried on this earth, pluck the young sucking cub from the she-bear, Yea, mock the lion when he roars for prey to win thee, lady. But 
last a while. If Hercules and Lycus play at dice, which is the better man? The greater throw may turn by fortune from the weaker hand, so is Alcides beaten by his page. And so may I, blind fortune leading me, miss that which one unworthier may attain, and die with grieving. You must take your chance, and either not attempt to choose at all, or swear before you choose, if you choose wrong, never to speak to lady afterward in way of marriage. Therefore be advised. Nor will not. Come, bring me unto my chance. First forward to the temple. After dinner your hazard shall be made. Good fortune, then, to make me blessed or cursedest among men. Certainly my conscience would serve me to run from this Jew, my master. The fiend is at my elbow and tempts me, saying to me, Gabo, Lancelot Gabo, good Lancelot, or good Gabo, or good Lancelot Gabo, use your legs, take the star, run away. My conscience says, no, <laughs> take heed, honest Lancelot. Take heed, honest Gabo. For as, as aforesaid, honest Lancelot, do not run, scorn running with thy ears. For the, the courageous fiend bids me back. Here, says the fiend. Away, says the fiend. Raise up a brave mind. Run, says the fiend. For well, my conscience hanging about the neck of my heart, says very wisely to me. Honest friend Lancelot, being an honest man's son, rather an honest woman's son, for indeed my father did something smack, something grow to. He had a kind of taste. Well, my conscience says, Honest Lancelot, budge not. Budge, says the fiend. Budge not, says my conscience. Conscience, say I, you counsel well. Fiend, say I, you, you counsel well. To be ruled by my conscience, I should stay with the Jew, who, God bless the mark, is a kind of devil. And to run from the Jew, I should be ruled by the fiend who, saving your reverence, is the devil himself. Certainly the Jew is the very devil incarnation, and in my conscience, my conscience is but a kind of hard conscience to offer to counsel me to stay with the Jew. The fiend gives a more friendly counsel. I will run, fiend. My heels are at your command. I will run. Master, young man, I pray you, which is the way to master Jews? Oh heavens, this is my true begotten father, who being more than sand blind, high gravel blind, knows me not. Master, I confusions with him. Master, young gentleman, I pray you, which is the way to master Jews? <clears throat> Turn up with your right hand at the next turning, but at the next turning of all on your left, Mary, at the very next turning, turn of no hand or turn down in directly to the Jew's house. Oh, by God, Santis will be a hard way to find. Do you know whether one Lancelot that dwells with him dwell with him or no? Talk you of young Master Lancelot? Mark me now. Now I will raise the wives. Talk you of young Master Lancelot? <laughs> no, Master, sir, but a poor man's son. His father, though I say it myself, God be thanked, is an honest, exceeding poor man, and well to live. Well, let his father be what he will. We talk of young 
Master Lancelot. Of your worship's friend and Lancelot, sir. I pray you, ergo, uh, old man, ergo, I beseech you, talk you of young Master Lancelot. Of Lancelot, and it please your mastership. Ergo, Master Lancelot. Talk no more of young Master Lancelot, for the old gentleman is indeed, a, according to the fates and destinies and such odd sayings, the sisters three and such branches of learning, he's indeed deceased. Or to put it in plain terms, gone to heaven. Oh, Mary, God, God forbid the boy was the very staff of my age, oh, my very prop. Do I look like a cudgel or a hobble post? <laughs> a, a staff or a prop? <laughs> Do you know me, Father? Alack, the day, young gentleman, I know you not. But I pray you tell me, is my boy, God rest his soul, alive or dead? Do you not know me, Father? Sir, I am sand blind. I know you not. Nay, indeed, hide your eyes, you might fail and annoy me. It's a wise father that knows his own child. Well, man, I'll give you news of your son. Give me your blessing. Truth will come to light. Murder cannot be hidden long. And son may, but in the end, truth will out. I pray you, sir, stand up. I am sure you are not Lancelot, my boy. I pray you, let's have no more fooling about it. Give me your blessing. I am Lancelot, your, your boy that was, your son that is, your child that shall be. I cannot think you are my son. I know not what I shall think of that. But I am Lancelot the Jews, man. And I am sure that Marjorie, your wife, is my mother. Her name is Marjorie indeed. I'll be sworn. If thou art Lancelot, then thou art mine own flesh and blood. Oh, the Lord, may he worship thee. <laughs> oh, but what a beard thou hast got. <laughs> thou hast more hair on thy chin than Dobbin, my line horse, hath on his tail. <laughs> it should appear, then, that Dobbin's tail goes backwards. For he had hair, more hair of his tail than I have of my face when I last saw him. Lord, how thou art changed. How dost thou and thy master agree? I have brought him a present. How agree you now? I brought him a present? Give him a halter. I am famished in his service. You can tell every finger I have with my ribs. Father, I am glad you are come. Give me your present to one Master Bassanio, who indeed gives rare new liveries. For if I serve not him, I will run as far as God has any ground. Oh, Ralph Fortune, here comes the man. To him, Father, for I am a Jew if I serve the Jew any longer. You may do so, but let it be so hasty that supper be ready at the farthest by five of the clock. See these letters delivered, and desire Gratiano to come anon to my lobby. To him, Father! Uh, God bless your worship. Gramercy, which thou art with me. Here's my son, sir, a, a poor boy. <laughs> Not a poor boy, sir, but the rich Jew's man. Uh, that would, sir, as my father shall specify. <laughs> he hath a great infection, as one would say, to serve. Uh, indeed. The, the sort of the long is that my, uh, the Jew, uh, having, uh, I do serve the Jew, and have a desire, as my father shall specify. Uh, he and his master, saving your worships, Reverence are scarce catered cousins. In very brief, the, the truth of the matter is this, that the Jew, having done me wrong, doth cause me, as my father, being, I, I hope, an old man shall fructify unto you. I have a dish of doves that I would bestow upon your worship, and my suit is... To be brief, but the suit is impertinent to myself, as your worship shall know from this honest old man, and though I say it, yet old man, yet poor man, my father. One speak for both. What would you? <laughs> to serve you, sir? That is the very defect of the matter, sir. Ah. I know thee well. Sherlock, thy master, spoke with me this day. And hath preferred thee, if it be preferment, to leave a rich Jew's service to become the follower of so poor a gentleman. Thou hast obtained thy suit. 
Go, Father, with thy son. Take leave of thy old master and inquire my lodging out. Uh, see it done. Come, Father. I cannot get a service. No. I have a tongue in my head. Why, if there be a man in Italy that doth have a, a fair palm which doth offer to swear upon a book, I have I will of good fortune go to. It's a simple line of life. Small trifle of wives. Alas, fifteen wives is nothing. <laughs> Eleven widows and nine maids is a, a simple coming in for one man. And to escape drowning rice. Oh, and be in peril of my life with the edge of a feather bed. These are simple escapes. Well, if fortune be a woman, she's a good wench for this business. Father, in. I'll be ready to take my leave of the Jew in the twinkling of an eye. I pray the uh, good lady, I don't think of this. These things being bought and orderly bestowed, return in haste. Bread and feast tonight, my best esteemed acquaintance. Hi, thee, go. My best endeavor shall be done here. Oh, where's your master? Yonder, sir, he walks. Oh, Signor Bassanio. Hey, Rosiana. <laughs> I have a seat for you. Oh, uh, you have obtained it. Now, you must not deny me. I must go with you to Belmont. Why then you must. But uh, here to thee, Graziano. That word too wild, too rude and bold of voice. Parts that become thee happily enough, and in such eyes as ours appear not false, but where thou art not known, there they show something too liberal. Crazy, take pain to allay with some cold drops of modesty thy skipping spirit. Lest through thy wild behavior I be misconstrued in the place I go to and lose my hopes. <laughs> my dear Bassanio, hear me. If I do not put on a sober habit, talk with respect, swear but now and then, wear prayer books in my pocket, look demurely, nay more, on grace to say, put mine eyes thus with my hand. Sigh and say amen. Use all observance of civility like one studied in a sad appearance to please his granddam. Oh, never trust me more. Well, we shall see your bearing. Okay, but I bar tonight. <laughs> you shall not judge me by what we do tonight. <laughs> no, that were pity. I would entreat you rather to put on your boldest suit of mirth, for we have friends that purpose merit. <laughs> uh, but. Yeah, fare you well, I have some business. Oh, and I must tell Lorenzo the rest, but we will visit you at supper time. I am sorry that will please my father so. Our house is hell, and now a merry devil did draw to some taste of tediousness. But fare thee well, there is a ducat for thee. And Launcelot, soon at supper shalt thou see Lorenzo, who is thy new master's guest. Give him this letter, do it secretly. And so farewell, I would not have my father see me and talk with thee. Adieu. Here's to exhibit my tongue, most beautiful pagan, most sweet Jew. If a Christian did not play the knave and get the eye, much deceived. But adieu. These foolish drops do something drown my manly spirit. Farewell, good Launcelot. Disguise us at my lodging and return all in an hour. We have not made good preparations. We have not arranged to have torchbearers. Tis vile, unless it may be elegantly arranged. And better in my mind not undertook. Tis now but uh, four o'clock. We have two hours to furnish us. <clears throat> oh, friend Launcelot, what's the news? If you shall break up this, it shall choose to signify. Ah, uh, I know the hand. In faith, tis a fair hand, and 
Whiter than the paper it writ on is the fair hand that writ. Ah, love news and faith. <laughs> Why do you leave, sir? Oh, oh, whither goest thou? Uh, Mary, sir, to bid my old master, the Jew, to sup tonight with my new master, the Christian. Yeah. Oh, well, hold here. Take this. Tell gentle Jessica I will not fail her. Oh, uh, uh, speak it privately. Go, oh, gentle friends, will you prepare you for the mass tonight? I am provided with a torch bearer. Aye, <laughs> Mary, I'll be gone about it straight. And so will I. <laughs> Meet me and Gratiano. Gratiano's lodging some hour hence. Tis good we do so. Was not that letter from uh, fair Jessica? <laughs> <laughs> I must see it's totally all. She hath directed how I shall take her from her father's house, what gold and jewels she is furnished with, what pages suit she hath in readiness. If ere the Jew her father go to heaven, it will be for this gentle daughter's sake. <laughs> and never dare misfortune cross her foot, unless she do it under this excuse. And she is issued to a faithless Jew. <laughs> now, wait, good God, go with me. Prove this as thou ghost. Fair Jessica, shall be my torch there. <laughs> well, thou shalt see. <laughs> thy eyes shall be thy judge, the difference of old Shylock and Bissanio. What, Jessica, <laughs> thou shalt not gormandize as thou hast done with me. <laughs> what, Jessica, and uh, <clears throat> sleep and snore and rend the peril out. <laughs> Why, Jessica, I say! Why, Jessica? Who bid thee call? I do not bid thee call. Your worship was wont to tell me that I could do nothing without bidding. Call you? What is your will? Uh, I have bid forth to supper, Jessica. Uh, there are my keys. <laughs> Wherefore should I go there? I am not bid for love. They, they flatter me. But yet I'll go in hate to feed upon the product of a Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, Jessica, my girl, look to my house. Uh, look to my house. Make sure that no unthrifty knaves enter. Oh, yes. Mm. Go, my, my young master doth expect your reproach. So do I his. We have conspired together. I will not say you shall see a mask, but if you do, it will not be for nothing that my nose fellow bleeding on Black Monday last at six o'clock in the morning, falling out at, at oh, Ash Wednesday at four years in the afternoon. What, are there masks? Ah, oh, hear you me, Jessica. Hey. Lock up my doors, and when you hear the sound of the drum and the vile squeal of the rhymed fife, clamber not you up to the casements then, nor thrust your head into the public street to gaze upon foolish Christians in varnished faces, but stop my house's ears. I mean my casements. Uh, by Jacob's staff, I, I don't mind feasting forth tonight. But I will go. Going before me, sir, say I will come. I will go before you, sir. Mistress, go to window. For all this, there will come a Christian by. We'll be worth a Jewish eye. What says that uh, fool of Hagar's offspring, eh? His words were. Farewell, mistress. Nothing else. Well, the patch is kind enough, uh, but a big fear. Snails slow in profit and sleeps by day more than the wildcat. <laughs> Drones I'm not with me. Therefore I part with him, and part with him to one who would have him help waste his borrowed purse. Well, Jessica, go in. Do as I bid you. Yes. 
five, that's five, a proverb never stale in thrifty mind. Back up, it blows up. Farewell. And if my fortune be not cross, I have a father, you a daughter lost. This is the penance of the which Lorenzo desired us to make stand. His hour is almost past. Normally a fool's his hour. The lovers ever run before the clock. <laughs> Who rises from a feast of that same uh, keen appetite with which he sits down? Where is the horse that doth untread again his tedious measures with the same unabated fire with which he did pace them first? All things that are are with more spirit chased than enjoyed. No, oh, how like uh, the younger son of Poto, the adorned bark puts from her native bay, hugged and embraced by the strumpet wind. I like the product of how she returned, with overweathered ribs, ragged sails, lean, rent, and beggared by the strumpet wind. Give Lorenzo more of this hereafter. Sweet friends, your patience for my long abode. Not I, but my affairs have made you wait. When it shall please you to play the thieves for love, I'll watch as long for you then. But approach. Here dwells my father Jew. Ho, oh, who's with me? Who are you? Tell me for more certainty. I'll be it, I'll swear that I do know your tongue. Lorenzo, and my love. Lorenzo, and my love indeed. For who am I so much? But now who knows but you, Lorenzo, whether I am yours? Heaven and my thoughts are witness that thou art. Here, catch this casket. It is worth the pain. Glad to the night you do not look on me. I am much ashamed of my exchange. But love is blind. Lovers cannot see the pretty follies that themselves commit. For if they could, Cupid himself would blush to see me thus transform into a boy. Descend, for you must be my torchbearer. What? Must I hold a candle to my shames? They in themselves could soothe are too, too late. Why, tis an office of discovery, love. And I should be obscured. So are you sweet, even in the lovely garnish of a boy. Well, but come at once, for the close night doth play the runaway, and we are stayed for at Pisanio's feast. I will make fast the doors and gild myself with some more ducats and be with you straight. Now by my hood, uh, gentile and no Jew. <laughs> well, you shrew me, but I love her heartily, for she is Wise, if I can judge of her, and fair she is, if that mine eyes be true, and true she is, as she hath proved herself, and therefore, like herself, wise, fair, and true, shall she be placed in my constant soul. What? Come, come. On gentle friends, away. Our masking mates by this time for us stay. Signor Antonio? Fie! Fie Gratiano! Where are all the rest? Tis nine o'clock! Our friends all stay for you! There's no mass tonight! The wind has come about! Bassanio will presently go aboard! Oh, I have sent twenty out to seek for you! Oh, I'm glad on it. I desire no more delight than to be under sail and gone tonight. Now make your choice. The first of gold, who this inscription bears, who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. The 
second silver, which this promise carries. Who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. The third, dull lead, with warning all his blood. Who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath. How will I know if I do choose the right? The one of them contains my picture, Prince. If you choose that, then I am yours with all. Some god, direct my judgment! Survey the inscriptions back again. What says this leaden casket? Who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath. Must give? For what? For lead? Hazard for lead. <laughs> this casket threatens. Men who hazard all do so in hopes of gaining fair advantages. A golden mine stoops not to show the draw, so then no give nor hazard off her lead. What says the silver with her virgin hue? Who chooses me shall get as much as he deserves. As much as he deserves. Pause there, Morocco. Weigh thy value with an even hand. If thou beest rated by thy estimation, thou dost deserve enough. Yet enough may not extend as far as to the lady. And yet to be a fear of my deserving, what but a weak disabling of myself? As much as I deserve. Well, that's the lady. I do in birth deserve her, and in fortunes and in graces, qualities of breeding. I do more than this. In love, I do deserve. What if I strayed no further but chose here? Let's see once more this same engraved in gold. Who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. Why, that's the lady. The whole world desires her. From the four corners of the earth they come to kiss this, this shrine, this mortal breathing saint. The Hyrcanian deserts and vasty wilds of Arabia there are thoroughfares now for princes to come and view, fair Portia. Oh, the watery kingdom, whose ambitious head spits in the face of heaven, is no bar to stop the princes as they come, as over a brook to see fair Portia. One of these three contains her heavenly picture. Is it like the lead contains her? For damnation to think so base a thought. It were too gross to rip her Sarah cloth in the obscure grave. Or shall I think in silver she's immured? In ten times undervalued to try gold? <laughs> oh, sinful thought. Never so rich a gem was set in worse than gold. They have in England a coin that bears the figure of an angel stamped in gold. But that's engraved upon. But here, 
An angel in a golden bed lies all within. Deliver me the key, for here I do choose and thrive as I may. There, take it, Prince, and if my form lie there, then I am yours. Death, within whose empty eye there is a written scroll. I'll read the writing. All that glisters is not gold. Often you have heard that told. Many a man his life hath sold, but my outside to behold. Gilded tombs do worms enfold. Had you been as wise as bold, young in limbs in judgment old, your answer had not been inscrolled. Fare you well. Your suit is cold. Cold indeed. And labor lost. Then farewell, heat, and welcome, frost. Portia, adieu. I have too grieved a heart to make a tedious leave. Thus, losers part. His complexion choose me so. Why, man, I saw Bassanio under sail. With him is Graziano got along, and in their ship, I am sure Lorenzo is not. <laughs> the villain too, with outcries, raised the Duchess. Who went with him to search Bassanio's ship? He was too late. The ship was under sail. And there the Duchess was given to understand that in a gondola were seen together Lorenzo and his amorous Jessica. Besides, Antonio certified the Duchess they were not with Pisano in his ship. I never heard a passion so confused, so strange, outrageous, and so variable as the dog Judith uttered in the streets. <laughs> my daughter. Oh, my ducats. richly fraught, <coughs> thought upon Antonio when he told me and wished in silence that it were not his. Who could you tell Antonio what you hear? <laughs> yet yeah. do not suddenly, for it may grieve him. A kinder gentleman treads not the earth. I saw Bassanio and Antonio part. Bassanio told him he would make some speed of his return. He answered, do not so. Slubber not business for my sake, Bassanio, but stay the very ripening of the time. As for the Jew's bond which he hath of me, let it not enter in your mind of love. 
Be merry and employ your chiefest thoughts to courtship and such fair ostents of love as shall conveniently become you there. And even there, his eye being big with tears, turning his face, he put his hand behind him and with affection wondrous sensible, he wrung Bassanio's hand. And so they parted. I think he only loves the world for him. I prithee, let us go and find him out and quicken his embraced heaviness with some delight or other. Do we so? Behold, there stand the caskets, noble prince. If you choose that wherein I am contained, straight shall our nuptial rites be solemnized. But if you fail, without more speech, my lord, you must be gone from hence immediately. I am enjoined by oath to observe three things. First, never to unfold to anyone which casket twas I chose. Next, if I fail of the right casket, never in my never immediately to leave you and be gone. To these injunctions, every one doth swear that comes to hazard for my worthless self. So have I addressed me. Fortune now to my heart's hope. Gold, silver, and a base lead. Who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath. You shall look fairer ere I give or hazard. What says the golden chest? Let me see. Who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. What many men desire. I be meant by the fool multitude that choose by show, not learning more than the fond eye doth teach, which ties not to the interior, but like the market, builds in the weather on the outward wall, even in the force and the road of casualty. I will not choose what many men desire, because I will not jump with common spirits and rape me with barbarous multitudes. Why then to thee, thou silver treasure house, tell me again what title thou dost bear. Truth me shall get as much as he deserves. And well said, too, for who shall go about to cousin fortune and be honorable without the stamp of merit? Let none presume to wear an undeserved dignity. Oh, the estates and degrees and offices were not derived corruptly, but purchased by the merit of the wearer. How many then will cover the stand there? How many be commanded that command? How much low peasantry would then be gleaned from the true seed of honor? And how much honor will the chaff and the ruin of the times to be new varnished? Why, then to my choice. Chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. I will assume desert. Get me a key for this, and instantly unlock my fortunes here. Long a pause for 
that's what you find there. What is this? Portrait of a, a blinking idiot presenting me a schedule. Uh, I will read it. How much I'm like I doubt a floor shop. How much am I buy? What's my deservings? Who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. Did I deserve no more than a, a fool's head? Is, is that my prize? Am I deserves no better? To offend and judge are distinct offices and are opposed natures. Fire seven times tried this, seven times tried that judgment is that did never choose amiss. Some there be the shadows kiss, such have but a shadow's bliss. There be fools alive who is silvered over, and so is this. Take a wife, you will dead. I will never be your head, so be gone. You are spent. Not a fool. I shall appear by the time I linger here. And one whose head I came to woo. But I go away with two. Adieu. I'll keep my own patiently to bear my own wrath. Thus hath a candle singed the moth. All these deliberate fools, when they do choose, they have the wisdom by their wits to lose. Here, what would you? Madam, there is a lighted at your gate a young Venetian, one who comes before to signify the approaching of his lord, from whom he bringeth sensible regrets, to wit, besides commands and courteous press, gifts of rich value. Yet I have not seen so likely an ambassador of love. A day in April never came so sweet to show how costly summer was at hand, as this poor spur comes before his lord. No more, I pray thee. I am half afeard thou wilt say anon he is some kin to thee. Thou spend such high day wit in praising him. Well, come, come, Larissa, for I long to see quick Cupid's post that comes so mannerly. Bassanio, Lord, love, if thy will it be. Now, what news on the Rialto? Why, yet it lives there unchecked that Antonio hath a ship of rich lady wrecked on the narrow seas. The good ones, I think they call the place? A very dangerous, flat, and fatal, where the carcasses of many a tall ship lie buried, as they say, if my gossip report be an honest woman of her word. I wish you were as lying a gossip in that as ever not ginger. Or made her neighbors believe she wept for the death of a third husband. It is true, then, without any slips of prolixity or crossing the plain highways of talk that the good Antonio, the honest Antonio, <laughs> that I had a title good enough to keep his name company. Oh, the full stop. What sayest thou? Why, the end is he hath lost a ship. It might prove the end of his losses. Let me say amen betimes to that, lest the devil cross my prayer. For here he comes in the likeness of a Jew. How now, Shylock? What news among the merchants? You know none so well, none so well as you of my daughter's life. That's certain. I, for my part, knew the tailor that made the wings she flew withal. And Shylock, for his own part, knew the bird was fledged. 
And then there's the complexion of them all to leave the dad. She is dead for it. Well, that's certain that the devil may be your judge. Oh, <laughs> flesh and blood to the devil. Out upon it! Oh, Karen! Rebels it at these years! I say, my daughter, is my flesh and blood. There is more difference between thy flesh and hers than between jet and ivory. <laughs> more between your bloods than there is between red wine and reddish. Mm. But you tell us, do you hear whether Antonio have had any loss at sea or no? There I have another bad match. Mm, the bankrupt, the prodigal, who dare scarce show his head upon the Rialto. A beggar who is used to come so smug upon the mart. Let him look to his body. He was wont to call me usual. Let him look to his bond. He was wont to lend out money as a Christian courtesy. Let him look to his bond. Why, well, I'm sure if he forfeit, thou wilt not take his flesh. What's that good for? To bait fish with all. If it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, altered my bargains, called my friends, heated my enemies, and what's his reason? I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions? Fed with the same food. Hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warm and cool by the same winter and summer as a Christian is? If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? If you wrong us, shall we not have revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his Sufferance be like Christian example. Why? Revenge. The villain that you teach me, I will execute, and it shall go hard. But I will. Antonio is at his house and wishes to speak with you both. We would have been up and down to see him. Here comes another of a tribe. A third cannot be matched unless the devil himself turns you. <laughs> How now, Tubu? What news from Genoa hast thou seen, my daughter? I often came or I did hear of her, but. Hey, there, 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 there! A diamond gone cost me 2,000 ducats in Frankfurt. The curse never fell on our tribe till now. I, I never felt it till now. 2,000 ducats in that and other precious, precious jewels. And would my daughter were dead at my foot, and the jewels in her ear, would you see, were her at my foot, and the ducats in her coffin. No loser of them, why so 
know. And I know not what he spent in the search. The thief gone with so much and so much to find the thief. And no satisfaction, no revenge. No, no ill luck story, but the lights on my shoulders. No sighs for the my reading. No tears for the my shame. Other men have ill luck too. Antonio, as I heard in Genoa. What? 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 Ill luck? Ill luck? Has an argosy cast away coming from Tripolis. Oh, I thank God. I thank God. Is it true? Is it true? I spoke to some of the sailors that escaped the wreck. <laughs> I thank you, good tool. Good news. Good news. Heard <laughs> in Genoa. In Genoa, your daughter spent in one night, as I heard, Two thousand ducats. Yes, it's the dagger in me. I shall never see my gold again. Four score ducats, and the city four score ducats. There came divers of Antonio's creditors in my company to Venice that swear he cannot choose but break. I am very glad of it. <laughs> I have plagued him. I have tortured him. I am glad of it. One of them showed me a ring he had of your daughter for a monkey. <laughs> thou upon her. <laughs> thou torturest me too. It was my turquoise. I had it of Leia when I was a bachelor. I, I would not have given it for a wilderness of monkeys. But Antonio is certainly undone. Yeah, that's true. That's certainly true. Yeah. Go to a female and officer. Bespeak him uh, a fortnight before. I have passed him if he thought it. Or were he not in Venice, I would make what merchandise I will. Go to and meet me at our synagogue. Go, go to at our synagogue, to My eyes shall be the stream 
watery deathbed for him. He may live. In what is music then? Then music is, even as the flourish, when true subjects bow to a new crowned monarch, such it is as are those dulcet sounds in break of day that creep into the dreaming bridegroom's ear and summon him to marriage. Now he goes, live thou, I live. With much, much more dismay I view the fight than thou that makes the fray. shows be least themselves. The world is still deceived with ornament. In law, what plea so tainted and corrupt, and yet being seasoned with a gracious voice, obscures the show of evil. In religion, what damned air but some sober brow will bless it, and to prove it with a text, hiding the grossness with fair ornament. There is no vice so simple, but assumes some mark of virtue on his outward parts. How many cowards who Hearts are all as false as stairs of sand, where yet upon their chins the beards of Hercules and frowning Mars, who inward searched have livers white as milk. Thus, ornament is but the guileless shore to a most dangerous sea. The beauty is scar failing in Indian beauty. In a word, the seeming truth, which cunning times do put on to entrap the wisest. Therefore, thou gaudy gold, hard food for Midas, I will none of thee. No, none of thee, thou pale and common drudge between man and man. But thou, thou meager lead, which rather threatenest than doth promise aught, thy paleness moves me more than eloquence. Here choose I, joy that be the consequence. Doubtful thoughts and rash embrace despair, and shudder. 
smothering fear, green-eyed jealousy, O oh, love, be moderate, allay thy ecstasy, in measure reign thy joy, scant this excess, I feel too much thy blessing, make it less, for fear I surfeit. Find her here. Fair Portia's counterfeit. What demigod has come so near creation? Move these eyes. Here are severed lips, parted with sugar bread. So sweet a bar should sunder such sweet friends. Here in her hairs the painter plays the spider, and hath woven a golden mesh to entrap the hearts of men faster than gnats and cobwebs. Oh, but her eyes, how did he see to do them? Having made one, he thinks it should have power to steal both his and leave itself unfurnished. And yet look. How far the substance of my praise hath wronged this shadow and underprizened, so far this shadow doth limp behind the substance. Here's the scroll, the consonants and summary of my fortune. You that choose not by the view, chance as fair and choose as true. Since this fortune falls to you, be content and seek no new. If you be well pleased with this and hold your fortune for your bliss, turn you where your lady is and claim her <laughs> with a loving kiss. A gentle scroll. Fair lady, by your leave I come, by note, to give and to receive, like one of two contending in a prize who thinks he hath done well in people's eyes, hearing applause and universal shout, giddy in spirit, still gazing in the doubt. Whether these peals of praise be here or no. So, thrice fair lady, stand I, even so, as doubtful whether what I see be true, until confirmed and signed and ratified by you. You see me, Lord Bassanio, where I stand such as I am, though for myself I would not be ambitious in my wish to wish myself much better, and yet for you I would be trebled twenty times myself, a thousand times more fair, ten thousand times more rich, that only to stand high in your account. I might in virtues, beauties, livings, friends exceed account. But the full sum of me is sum of something which to term in gross is an unlessened girl, unschooled, unpractised. Happy in this, she is not yet so old, but she may learn. Happier in this, she is not bred so dull, but she can learn. Myself, and what is mine, you and yours is now converted. But now I was master of this fair mansion, master of these servants and queen or myself. And even now, but now, this house, these servants, and this same myself are yours, my lords. I give them with this ring, which when you 
part from lose or give away, let it presage the ruin of your love and be my vantage to exclaim on you. Madam, you have bereft me of all words. <laughs> Only my blood speaks to you in my veins. And there is such a confusion <laughs> in my heart. As after some oration fair and spoke, my beloved prince and other dear among the buzzing and pleased multitude, where every something being blent together turns to a wild of nothing. Save of joy, expressed and not expressed. But when this ring parts from this finger, then parts life from hence. Oh, then be bold to save Bassanio's day. <laughs> My lord and lady, it is now our time that have stood by and seen our wishes prosper to cry good joy, good joy, my lord and lady. <laughs> my lord, Bassanio, and my gentle lady, I wish you all the joy that one can wish. And when your honors mean to solemnize the bargain of your fate, I do beseech you that on that day I may be married too. Uh, with all my heart, so that I can save my life. Thank you, my lord. You have got me one. My eyes, my lord, can look as swift as yours. When you beheld the mistress, I beheld the maid. You love, I love. Your fortune stood upon the caskets there. And so did mine, as the matter stands. But in owing, wooing oaths of love, I I got a promise of this fair one here to have her love, uh, provided that your fortune achieved her mistress. Is this true, Larissa? Madam, it is. So you stand pleased with all. And do you, Gratia? <laughs> be good faith. Yes, faith, my lord. Our feast will be much older than your beverage. We'll play with the first boy for a thousand ducats. <laughs> <laughs> what, who comes oh. here? Lorenzo and his infidel. What, my old Venetian friend, Solaria? Lorenzo, Solaria, welcome hither. Uh, by your leave, I can my very friends and cousin and sweet Portia. Welcome. So do I, they are entirely welcome. Thank your honor. Uh, my part, my lord, my purpose was not to have seen you here, but meeting with Solaria on the way, she did entreat me past all saying nay to come with her along. I did, my lord, and I have reason for it. Signor Antonio commends me to you. Uh, er, pleasure. I pray thee, tell me how my good friend's health. Not sick, my lord, unless it be in mine, nor well, unless in mine. His letter there will show you his estate. Where is it? Cheer you on, stranger. Bitter welcome. Your hand. Solera. What news from Venice? How about that royal merchant, good Antonio? Will you be glad of our successes? We the Jasons? We won the fleece. I would you had won the fleece that he'd have lost. There are some shrewd contents in yon same paper that steals the color from Bassanio's cheek. Some dear friend dead? Else nothing in this world could turn so much the constitution of any constant man. What worse and worse? But leave, Bassanio, I am half yourself, and I must freely have the half of anything that this same paper brings you. Sweet Portia, here are a few of the unpleasantest words that ever blot a paper. Gentle lady, when I did first impart my love to you, I freely told you all the wealth I had ran within my veins. I was a gentleman, and then I told you true. And yet, Dear lady, rating myself at nothing, you shall see how much I was a braggart. For when I said my state was nothing, 
I should then have told you that I was worse than nothing. For indeed, I have engaged myself to a dear friend, engaged my friend to his mere enemy, to feed my means. Here is a letter, lady, the paper as the body of my friend, and every word in it, gaping wound, issuing life blood. But is it true, Samaria? Has all his ventures failed? What? Not one hit? From Tripolis, from Mexico, from England, from Lisbon, Barbary, and India. Not one vessel escaped the dreadful touch of merchant Barry rocks. Not one, my lord. Besides, it should appear that if he had the present money to discharge the Jew, he would not take it. Never did I know a creature that did bear the form of man so keen and greedy to confound a man. He plies the Duchess morning and night and doth impeach the freedom of the same if they deny him justice. Twenty merchants, the Duchess herself and the Magnificos have all persuaded with him. But none can drive him from his envious plea of forfeiture, of justice, and his bond. When, when I was with him, I had heard him swear to Tubal and to Chas's countrymen that he would rather have Antonio's flesh than twenty times the value of the sum that he did owe him. And I know, my lord, that if law, authority, and power deny not, it will go hard with poor Antonio. Is it your dear friend that is thus in trouble? The dearest friend to me, the, the kindest man. What sum owes he the Jew? For me, 3,000 ducats. What? No more? Pay him 6,000 and deface the bond. Double 6,000, then treble that, before a friend of this description shall lose a hair through Bassanio's fault. First, go with me to church and call me wife. And then away to Venice to your friend. For never shall you lie by Portia's side with an unquiet soul. You shall have gold to pay the petty debt twenty times over. When it is paid, bring your true friend along. My maid Larissa and myself, meantime, will live as maids and widows. Come away, for you shall hence upon your wedding day. Bid your friends welcome, show a merry cheer. Since you are dear bought, I will love you dear. But let me hear the letter from your friend. Sweet Bassanio, my ships have all miscarried, my creditors grow cruel, my estate is very low, my bond to the Jew is forfeit. And since in paying it, it is impossible I should live. All debts are clear between you and I, if I might but see you at my death. Notwithstanding, use your pleasure, if your love did not persuade you to come. Love, not my letter. Love, dispatch all business and be gone. But since I have your leave, go away. I will make haste. But until I come again, no bed shall e'er be guilty of my stay. No rest be interposer twixt us twain. And not me of his master. Hear me, yet good Shylock. And have my bond. Speak not against my bond. I have sworn an oath that I will have my bond. Thou callest me dog before thou hadst cause. But since I am a dog, beware my fence. The Duchess shall grant me justice. I pray you, hear me speak. I have my love. I will not hear thee speak. I have my love. Here! Speak no more. It is the most impenetrable cur that ever kept with men. Let him alone. I'll follow him no more with Cooper's prayers. I am sure the Duchess will never grant this forfeiture to hold. The Duchess cannot deny the course of law. 
for the, for the commodity that strangers have with us in Venice, if it be denied, would much impeach the justice of the state. No, oh, therefore go. These, these griefs and losses have so baited me that I should hardly spare a pound of flesh tomorrow to my bloody creditor. So pray God Bassanio come to see me play his death. And then I care not. Lorenzo, I commit to your hands the husbandry and manage of my house until my lord's return. For my own part, I have toward heaven breathed a secret vow to live in prayer and contemplation, only attended by Nerissa here until her husband's and my lord's return. There is a monastery two miles off, and there we will arrive. I do desire you not to deny this imposition, for which my love and some necessity now lays upon you. Madam, with all my heart, I shall obey you in all fair commands. I fare you well, till we shall meet again. Their thoughts and happy hours attend on you. I wish your ladyship all hearts content. I thank you for your wish and am pleased to wish it back on you. Fare you well, Jessica. Now, Stefano. As I have ever found the honest true, so let me find thee still. Take this same letter, and use thou all the endeavor of a man in speed to Padua. See thou render this into my cousin's hands, Dr. Valario, and look what note and garments he doth give thee. Oh, bring them, I pray thee, with imagined speed unto the ferry which trades to Venice. Waste no time in words, but get thee gone. I shall be there before thee. Madam, I go with all convenient speed. Larissa, I have work in hand you yet know not of. We shall see our husbands before they think of us. Shall they see us? They shall, Larissa, but in such a habit that they shall think we are <clears throat> accomplished with what we lack. Why? Sworn to have the due and forfeit of my vow. 
If you deny it, then let the danger light upon your charter and your city's freedom. You'll ask me why I'd rather choose to have the weight of carrying flesh than to receive three thousand ducats. I'll not answer that. But say it is my humor. Is it answer? What if my house be troubled with a rat, and I'd be pleased to give ten thousand ducats to have it baked? What? Are you answered yet? Some men there are that love not the gaping game. Some that are mad when they behold a cat, and others, when the bagpipe sings in the nose, cannot contain their urine. For affection, mistress of passion, sways it to the mood of what it likes or loathes. Now for your answer. As there is no firm reason to be rendered, why he cannot abide a gaping cat, why he a harmless necessary cat, why he a woolen bagpipe, but a force must yield to such inevitable shame as to offend himself being offended. So can I give no reason, nor will not, more than a lodged hate and a certain loathing I bear for Antonio, that I follow thus this losing suit against him. Are you answered? This is no answer, thou unfeeling man to excuse the current of thy cruelty. I am not bound to please thee with my answers. <laughs> do all men kill the things they do not love? Hate any man the thing he would not give. Every offense is not to hate it first. What? Wouldst thou have a servant sting thee twice? I pray you, think you question with the Jew. You may as well stand upon the beach and bid the main flood bay his usual height. You may as well use question with the wolf as to why he make the ewe bleed for the lamb. You may as well forbid the mountain pines from wagging their high tops and make no noise when they are fretted by the gusts of heaven. No, I beseech you. Make no more offers. Use no farther means. Give me the judgment and the Jew as well. Thy three thousand ducats, here is six. If every ducat in six thousand ducats were in six parts, and each part a ducat, I would not draw them and have my bond. How shall fall for mercy, entering none? What judgment shall I dread, doing no wrong? <laughs> you have among you many a purchased slave. Which, like your asses, your dogs, and your mules, you use in abject and in slavish part because you bought them. Shall I say to you, let them be free, marry them to your heirs, let their beds be as made as soft as yours, and their palate seasoned with such viands? You will answer, the slaves are ours. So do I answer you. The pound of flesh which I demand of him is dearly bought. Tis mine, and I will have it. If you deny me, fire upon your law. There is no force in the decrees of death. I stand here for judgment. Answer! Shall I have it? Upon my power, I may dismiss this court. Unless Bellari or Lord and Doctor, I have sent for to determine this, come here today. My lady, this day's without a messenger. With letters from the doctor, new come from Padua. Oh, uh, bring the letter, call the messenger. The cheer is coming. What may I hear again? The priest shall have my blood, blood cold and all. That thou shalt lose for me one drop of blood. I am a tainted weather of the flock, lingus for death. The weakest kind of fruit falls early to the ground, so let me. You can be no better employed, Bassanio, 
than to live still and write my epitaph. Come you from Padua, from Valaria, from both, my lady. Valaria, greet your grace. Why does I stand with thy knight at the ready? <laughs> to cut the forfeiture from that bankrupt there. Not on thy soul, but on thy soul, Marsh Jew. Thou makest thy knife keen, but no metal can. No, not the hanging that. There hath the keenness of thy sharp envy. What, can no prayers pierce thee? No, none that thou hast wit enough to me. Be thou damned inexorable dog, and for thy life let justice be accused. Thou almost makest me waver in my faith to hold opinion with the Thagras that the souls of animals abuse themselves with the trunks of men. Thy tourist spirit govern a wolf, who, hanged for human slaughter, even from the gallows did his fell soul fleet. And while thou liest in thy unhallowed dam, did abuse itself in thee, for thy desires are the wolfish, blood-starved, and ravenous. Till thou canst rail the seal from off my body, thou thinst thy lungs to speak so loud. <laughs> Repair thy wit, good youth, or it will fall into cureless ruin. I stand here for long. This letter from Bellario doth commend a young and learned doctor to our court. Where is he? He attendeth here hard by to know your answer, whether you'll admit him. With all my heart, go and give him courteous conduct to this place. cause and controversy between the Jew and Antonio the Merchant. We turned over many books together. He is furnished with my opinion, which, better with his own learning, the greatness whereof I cannot enough command, comes with him at my importunity to fill up your grace's request in my stead. I leave him to your grace's acceptance, whose trial shall better publish his commendation. You hear the learned Valario, what he writes? Oh, here I take it is the doctor. Come, give me your hands. Coming from old Valario? I do, my lord, my lady. You are welcome. Take your place. Are you acquainted with the difference that holds the present question in the court? I am thoroughly informed of the cause. Which is the merchant here and which the Jew? Antonio and old Shylock both stand forth. Is your name Shylock? Shylock is my name. Of a strange nature is the suit you follow, yet in such rule that the Venetian law cannot impugn you as you do proceed. You stand within his danger, do you not? Aye, so he says. Do you confess the bond? I do. Then must the Jew be merciful. <laughs> Upon what compulsion must I tell me that? Quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. It is mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throne in monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy Seasons justice. Therefore, Jew, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, 
and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. I have spoke thus much to mitigate the justice of thy plea, which if thou follow, this strict court of Venice must needs give sentence against the merchant there. My deeds upon my head, I crave the law that you and forfeit on my bond. Is he not able to discharge the money? Yes, I hear a tender form in the court. Yea, twice the sum. That will not suffice. I will be about to pay it. Ten times over, on forfeit of my hands, my head, my heart. If that will not suffice, it must appear that malice bears down truth. And I beseech you, rest once the law to your authority. To do a great right, do a little wrong. And curb this cruel devil of his will. It must not be. There is no power in Venice can alter a decree established. It will be recorded for a precedent, and many an error by the same example will rush into the state. It cannot be. Then come to judgment. Yea, a dandel. O wise young judge, how I do honor thee. I pray you, let me look upon the bond. It is, most reverend doctor. It is. Shylock, there's thrice thy money offered thee. An oath, an oath, an oath I have in heaven. Shall I make perjury on my soul? No, not for Venice. Why, this bond is forfeit. And lawfully by this the Jew may claim a pound of flesh to be by him cut off nearest the merchant's heart. Be merciful. Take thrice thy money. Bid me tear the bond. When it is paid according to the tender, it doth appear you are a noble judge. You know the law. Your exposition hath been most sound. I charge you by the law of which you are a well-deserving pillar, proceed to judgment. By my soul, I swear, there is no power in the tongue of man to alter me. I stay here on my bond. I do hardly beseech the court. Give the judgment. Why then, thus it is. You must prepare your bosom for his night. For the intent and purpose of the law hath full relation to the penalty which here appeareth due upon the bond. Oh, wise and upright judge. Therefore, lay bare your bosom. Aye. His breast, so says the bond, doth it not, noble judge, nearest his heart. Those are the very words. It is so. Are there balance here to weigh the flesh? I have them ready. Have by some surgeon, Shylock, on your charge to stop his wounds lest he do bleed to death. Is it so nominated in the bond? It is not so expressed, but what of that? To a good you do so much for charity. I cannot find it. It is not in the bond. You, merchant. Have you anything to say? But little. I am honored and well prepared. Give me your hand, Bassanio. Grieve not that I have fallen to this for you. For here, fortune shows herself more kind than is her custom. It is still her use to let a wretched man outlive his wealth, to view with hollowed eye and wrinkled brow an age of poverty from which lingering penance of such misery doth she cut me off. Commend me to your honorable wife. Tell her the process of Antonio's end. Tell her that I loved you. Speak fair of me in death, and when the tale be told, bid her be judged whether Bassanio had not once a love. And repent but not that you have lost a friend, and he repents not that he pays this debt for you. 
For if the Jew do cut but deep enough, I pay it presently with all my heart. Antonio, I am married to a wife which is as dear to me as life itself. But life itself, my wife and all the world are not with me esteemed above thy life. I would lose all. I sacrifice them all here to this devil to deliver you. The wife would give you little thanks for that if she would buy to hear you make the offer. I have a wife. I protest I love for which you were in heaven so I could entreat some power to change this courage Jew. Well, that you should offer it behind your back. <laughs> These... You should make out an unquiet house. These be the Christian husbands, huh? I have a daughter. Would that any of the stock of Barabbas had been her husband rather than a Christian. We shall not tire. I pray you, pursue sentence. A pound of that same merchant's flesh is thine. The court awards it, and the law doth give it. Most rightful judge. And you must cut this flesh from off his breast. The law allows it, and the court awards it. Most learned judge. A sentence, come. Prepare. Terry, <laughs> a little. There is something else. This bond doth give thee here no jot of blood. The words expressly are a pound of flesh. Take then thy bond, take thou thy pound of flesh. But in the cutting of it, if thou dost shed one drop of Christian blood, thy lands and goods are by the laws of Venice confiscate unto the state of Venice. Oh, what right, judge? Mark, you a, a learned judge? Is that the law? Thyself shall see the act. For as thou urgest justice, be assured, thou shalt have justice more than thou desirest. Learned judge, mark you, a learned judge. I take this off again. They thrice the Bible and let the Christian go. Uh, here's the money. Soft! The Jew shall have all justice. Soft, no haste. He shall have nothing but the penalty. Right, judge. Mark you a, a learned judge. Therefore, prepare thee to cut off the flesh. Shed thou no blood, nor cut thou less nor more, but just a pound of flesh. If thou takest more or less than a just pound, be it but so much as makes it light or heavy in the substance, or the division of the twentieth part of one poor scruple. Nay, if the scale do turn but in the estimation of a hair, thou diest, and all thy goods are confiscate. Oh, Daniel! Now, infidel, I have you on the hair. Why doth the Jew pause? Take thy forfeiture. Give me my principal and let me go. I have read of the He has refused it in the open court. He shall have merely justice and his bond. Shall I not have been my principal? Thou shalt have nothing but the forfeiture. To be so taken at thy peril, Jew. Second Daniel. I thank thee, Jew, for teaching you that word. <laughs> Devil give him good of it. I'll stay no longer question. Terry, do! The law hath yet another hold on you. It is enacted in the laws of Venice, if it be proved against an alien, that by direct or indirect attempts he seek the life of any citizen. The party against the which he doth contrive shall seize one half his goods. The other half comes to the privy coffer of the state. <laughs> and the offender's life lies in the mercy of the duchess only. 
in which predicament I say thou stands. For it appears by manifest proceeding that indirectly and directly too thou hast contrived against the very life of the defendant, and thou hast incurred the danger formerly by me rehearsed. Down, therefore, and beg mercy of the Duchess. Beg that thou hast leave to hang thyself. Oh, but thy will being forfeit to the state, oh, thou hast not left the value of a core. No. Therefore, thou shalt be hanged at the state's charge. <laughs> Thou shalt see the difference of our spirit. I pardon thee thy life before thou ask it. For half thy fortune it is Antonio's. The other half comes to the general state, which humbleness may drive unto a fine. I am for the state, not Antonio. Hey, take my life and all. Pardon not that. You take my house when you do take the property. Don't sustain my house. You take my life, but you do take the means for what I love. What mercy can you render him, Antonio? A halter gratis? Nothing else, for God's sake. Yeah. Well, my lady the Duchess and all the court, to quit the fine for half his goods, I am content. And so you will let me have the other half in use to render upon his death to the gentleman that lately stole his daughter. <laughs> Two other things provided more. That presently he become a Christian. <laughs> The other that he do record a gift in the court of all he dies possessed unto his son Lorenzo and his daughter. You shall do this, unless I do repent the pardon I late pronounce it here. Art thou contented, Jew? What dost thou say? Uh, I am content. Clerk, draw the deed of gift. I pray you, uh, give me leave to go from hence. I am not well. Send the deed after me, I will sign it. Get thee God that do it. In christening, thou wilt have two godfathers. Well, had I been judged, thou would have ten more. To bring me to the gallows, not the font. <laughs> Sir, I am seeking to go home with you, sir. I humbly do desire your grace of pardon. I must away this night toward Padua, and it is meet I presently set forth. I'm sorry your leisure soon did not. It's only a better by this gentleman, for in my mind, you are much bound to him. Most worthy gentlemen, I and my friend have, by your wisdom, been to stay acquitted of grievous penalties. In lieu whereof, three thousand ducats do unto the Jew. We do freely cope your courtiest pains withal, and stand indebted above and beyond in love and service forevermore. He is well paid and is well satisfied, and I delivering you am satisfied, and therein do account myself well paid. My mind was never yet more mercenary. I pray you, know me when we meet again. I wish you well. So I take my leave. Uh, dear sir, of course I must attempt you further. Take some remembrance of us as a tribute, not an unfee. Grab me two things, I pray you, not to deny me and pardon me. You press me far, and therefore I shall yield. Give me your gloves. I'll wear them for your sake. And for your love, I'll take this ring from you. If do not draw back your hand, I'll take no more, and you in love shall not deny me this. This ring? Good sir. Uh, alas, it is a trifle. I will not shame myself to give you this. I'll have nothing else but only this, and now he thinks I have mine to it. Uh, there's more depends on this and all the value. The dearest ring in Venice will I give you, and find it out by proclamation. Only, 
For this, I bring your pardon me. I see, sir, you are liberal in offer. You taught me first to beg, and now methinks you teach me how a beggar should be answered. Good sir, this ring was given me by my wife. And when she put it on, she made me vow that I should neither sell nor give nor lose it. That skew serves many men to save their gifts. And if your wife be not a mad woman, and know how well I have deserved the ring, she would not hold out enemy forever for giving it to me. Well, peace be with you. I pray you, good Sonio, give him the ring. Let his deservings and my love with all be valued against your wife's commandment. Go, I brought you out on the front of the table. Give him the ring. Bring him a duck camp into Antonio's house. Away, make haste. Come, you and I will thither presently. And in the morning early will we both fly toward Belmont. Come, Antonio. Inquire the Jew's house out. Give him this deed and let him sign it. We'll away tonight and be a day before our husband's home. This deed will be well welcomed to Lorenzo. Oh, fair sir. <laughs> Your well retained. <clears throat> Bassanio, upon more advice, doth send you this room, and doth entreat your company at dinner. That cannot be. His ring I do most thankfully accept, and so I pray you tell him. And furthermore, I pray you show my youth old Shylock's house. Uh, uh, that will I do. Sir, I would speak with you. I will see if I can get my husband's ring. Which I did make him swear to keep forever. Amazed, I warrant. We'll have old swearing that they did give the rings away to men, but we'll outface them and outswear them too. Away, make haste, thou knowest where I will tear it. Come, good sir, will you show me to this house? The moon shines bright. On such a night, when the wind did sweetly kiss the trees and they did make no noise. Troilus, methinks, <laughs> mounted on the Trojan walls, and sighed his soul toward the Grecian tents, where Crescent lay that night. In such a night, did this be fearfully our trick to do, and saw the lion shout out fair Carabas, and ran us me away. In such a night stood Dido with a willow in her hand upon the wild sea banks, and walked her love to come again to Carthage. In such a night, Medea gathered the enchanted herbs that hindered you. In such a night did Jessica steal from the wealthy Jew, and with an unthrift love did run from Venice as far as Belmont. In such a night did young Lorenzo swear he loved her well, stealing her soul many vows of faith, and there a true one. In such a night did pretty Jessica, like a little shrew, slander her love and... I would outnight you. Did no one come? Oh, oh. Hear the heart of the man. Yeah. Uh, who comes so fast in the silence of the night? It's like Stefan. I bring word my mistress will before the break of day be here at Belmont. She doth stray about by holy crosses, where she kneels and prays for the happy wedlock house. Well, who comes with her? None but a holy hermit and her maid. I pray you, does Bassanio yet return? Well, he is not, nor we have not heard from him. Well, signify within the house, I pray you, your mistress is at hand. Oh, and bring your music forth into the air. How sweet the moonlight sleeps upon this bank. Here will we sit, and let the sounds of music creep into our ears. Soft stillness and the night become the touches of sweet harmony. Well, sit, Jessica. Look how the floor of heaven is thick and laid with patterns of bright gold. There's not the smallest orb which thou beholdst, but in his motion, like an angel, sings, still choir into the young high cherubins. Such harmony is in immortal souls, but Whilst this muddy vesture of decay doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it.
Well, the reason is, your spirits are attentive. For do but note a wild and wanton herd, or race of youthful and unhandled colts, fetching mad bounds, bellowing and neighing loud, which is the hot condition of their blood. If they but hear, perchance, a trumpet sound, or any air of music touch their ears, you shall perceive them make a mutual stand. Their savage eyes turn to a modest gaze by the sweet power of music. Therefore the poet did feign that Orpheus drew trees, stones, and floods, since not so stuck his heart and full of rage, but music for the time doth change his nature. The man that hath no music in himself, nor is not moved with concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils. The motions of his spirit are dull as night, and his affections dark as Erebus. Let no such man be trusted. Will he live to be a man? I am a woman live to be a man. Now by my 
I gave it to a clerk, a little scrubbed one, no higher than myself. The judge's clerk who begged it as his fee, I, I could not for my heart deny it. You were to blame. I must be plain with you. To part so slightly from your wife's first gift, a thing stuck on with oaths upon your finger, and so riveted with faith unto your flesh. I gave mine love a ring and made him swear never to part with it. And here he stands. I dare thee sworn for him. He would not leave it nor pluck it from his finger for the wealth that the world masters. Now in faith, Gratiano, you give your wife too unkind a cause of grief. If twere to me, I should be mad at it. Why, I were to cut my left hand off. That's where I lost the ring to bending it. My lord Bassanio gave his ring away unto the judge who begged it, and indeed deserved it too. And the clerk who took some pains away, he begged mine. And neither man nor master would take off but the two rings. What ring gave you, my lord? Not that I hope which you received of me. If I could add a lie unto a fault, I, I would deny it, but. You see my finger hath not the ring of it. It is gone. Even so void is your false heart of truth. But by heaven, I will never come in your bed until I see the ring. Nor I in yours till I again see mine. Oh, a sweet portion. If, if, if you didn't know to whom I gave the ring, if you didn't know for whom I gave the ring, if, for, for what I gave the ring, and how willingly I left the ring, when, when not would be accepted but the ring, uh, you would have made the strength of your displeasure. If you had known the virtue of the ring, or half the worthiness that gave the ring, for your own honor to contain the ring, you would not then have parted with the ring. <laughs> what man is there so much unreasonable? If you had pleased to have defended it with any terms of zeal, wanted the modesty to urge the thing held as ceremony, Nerissa teaches me what to believe. I'll die for it. But some woman had the ring! I don't know. I'm out of it, madam. By my soul, no woman had it. But a, a civil doctor. <sighs> Who did refuse 3,000 ducats of me? Uh, and begged the ring, uh, the which I did deny him, and suffered him to go displeased away, uh, even he that did uphold the very life of my dear friend. Uh, what should I say, sweet lady? I was in force to send it after him. I was beset with shame and courtesy. My honor would not let ingratitude so much be spirit. Pardon me. Good lady. For by these blessed candles of the night, had you been there, I think you would have begged the ring of me to give the worthy doctor. Let not that doctor e'er come near my house, since he hath got the jewel that I loved, and that which you did swear to keep for me, I will become as liberal as you. I'll not deny the doctor anything I have. No, not my body, nor my husband's bed. Know him I shall, I am well sure of it. Lie not to light from home. Watch me like Artemis. If you do not, if I be left alone, then by my honor, which is yet my own, I'll have that doctor for my bedfellow. I is clerk. <laughs> Therefore, be well advised how you do lead me to my own protection. Well, you do so, but not being taken, for if I do, all more than your clerk's pen. Oh, I am the unhappy subject of these quarrels. Oh, sir, grieve you not. You are welcome notwithstanding. I, I did once lend my body for his wealth, which but for him that had your husband's ring had quite miscarried. I, I dare be bound again, my, my soul on the forfeit, that your lord will never more break faith advisedly. 
then you shall be his surety. Give him this, and bid him keep it better than the other. My Lord Bassanio, swear to keep this ring. By heaven, it's just the same I gave the doctor. I had it of him. Pardon me, Bassanio, for by this ring, the doctor lay with me. <sighs> and pardon me, my gentle Gratiano, for that same scrubbed one, the doctor's clerk, in lieu of this last night, did lie with me. <sighs> This is like the mending of highways in summer when the ways are fair enough. What, are we cuddles or we deserve it? Speak not so grossly. You are all amazed. Here is a letter. Read it at your leisure. It comes from Padua, from Bellario. There you shall find that Portia was the doctor. Nurse here, her clerk. Lorenzo there shall bear witness. I set forth as soon as you, and even but now returned. I have not yet entered my house. Antonio, you are welcome, and I have better news in store for you than you expect. Unseal this letter soon. There you shall find three of your argosies are richly come to harbor suddenly. You shall not know by what strange accident I chanced on the letter. I am dumb. Were you the doctor? And I knew you not. And you were the clerk just to make me humble? Aye, but the clerk that never means to do it, unless he live until he be a man. Sweet doctor, you shall be my bedfellow. And when I am absent, I'll then lie with my wife. <laughs> Sweet lady, you have given me life and living. For here I be for certain that my ships have all come safely to Rome. How now, Lorenzo? My clerk hath some good comforts too for you. Aye, and I'll give them him without your fee. There do I give you and Jessica from the rich Jew a special deed of gift after his death of all he dies possessed of. Uh, I, 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 I. I Fair ladies, you drop men out of the way of starving people. It is almost morning, and yet I am sure you are not satisfied with these events at fault. Let us go in and charge us there upon the turgatories, and we shall answer all things faithfully. Let it be so. <laughs> and the first interrogatory that my Russell shall be sworn on is whether she had rather stay or go to bed now, it'll be two hours today. <laughs> but was the day come? I would wish it dark, and I were uh, couching with the doctor's clerk. <laughs> For a while I live, I'll fear no other thing so sore as keeping safe nurses ring.